so uh, we needed the discussion about readout to understand this. Uh, after all, everything uh, ends up uh, with a readout in uh, in circuit QED. So, Alexander, well, in physics, I think right? Can, yeah, I think we can only see one part of the screen. Now we can see it. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Okay, uh, so I will unfortunately have to. No, oh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, does it change anything if I do this? Does it become small for you? Uh, no, it's, it's good. Looks good to me. It's the same. Okay, good. Perfect. So I made it uh, very small in the corner for me. Good. So <clears throat> what do we have? Uh, what are we talking about? Well, uh, uh, let's go back to basics. So what Jens uh, told you was that the Hamiltonian describing uh, light matter interaction is something of the following form, right? Or maybe you wrote this last bit as a sigma x. And that's called the Rabi Hamiltonian. And then he, he told you that you can do a rotating wave approximation, drop terms such as uh, a dagger sigma plus or a sigma minus that rotate fast, you can obtain a simplification of the Hamiltonian, which is the James Cummings Hamiltonian. That's the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And then we went one step further and said, okay, well, if you now assume that resonator and, and qubit are far apart in frequency or strongly detuned, the detuning is much stronger than, than G. Uh, then you obtain this dispersive interaction, dispersive Hamiltonian. And in this, uh, in the last hour, 45 minutes, I will go over these Hamiltonians and some of the, the, the so I'll go over some of the consequences of, of, of strong coupling in this James coming Hamiltonian. Then we will re revisit the disperse, this dispersive Hamiltonian and consider a different point of view uh, on how to, to see this Hamiltonian and the consequences of this Hamiltonian. And if time permits, we will go back to the Ravi Hamiltonian and ask, is there a regime where the terms that we dropped are in fact important? And there is such a regime and it's known as the ultra strong coupling regime. But for now, let's start with the James Cumming Hamiltonian and consider the resonant uh, regime. So now if I take the qubit cavity detuning to be equal to zero, in that case, obviously the dispersive regime is not applicable. So this is, uh, we now have to move to this Hamiltonian. So we already know what the spectrum of this Hamiltonian looks like. So, so this is something that if, if not, uh, please let me know, but this is something what, that Jens will have, uh, have done uh, with you. So he told you that uh, you can have a qubit in the ground state and that qubit uh, can be accompanied with zero photon or, or one photon, oops, or, or two or, or many uh, photons in the cavity. And that these states are separated by the cavity frequency, the resonator frequency. On the other hand, you can have a qubit, which is rather in the excited state. And in the excited state, this has a frequency which is above the ground state, right? That's a frequency which is above the ground state, which is now the qubit frequency, or I call this A, right? And once you're in the ground state, sorry, the excited state, you can have zero photon, uh, one photon, or more photons. And now the regime that I've considered now is a case where omega r is equal to omega A, where the detuning is zero, where these pairs of levels of align. In that situation, uh, as I'm sure Jens has described, uh, the ground states is unchanged. The ground state of the system 
stays the ground state, which is G0. Something which, by the way, won't be true in the Rabi Hamiltonian out there. But now let's not think about that for now. And what you have at that point are doublets of states, right? If Jens didn't say, uh, I'm going fast here because I assume it was, this was done. If not, please, if it wasn't done, please tell me. So now you have doublets of states, which are separated by twice the light matter interaction strength. And furthermore, this uh, uh, splitting increases as you go up the ladder. It goes up to become two square root of n, in this particular case, two square root of g. And the square root of n is simply a signature of the fact that this Hamiltonian scales as g square root of n, right? Because that, the matrix element of these operators is square root of n. So what you're seeing is a direct signature of the this, this structure of the creation and addition operators of single photons. I'll come back to that later. Uh, great. And so the states associated are the, are the ground states, the, which are, which I'll, I'll put a bar to distinguish states in the presence of coupling. So that will be G not equal to zero, coupling G. And uh, uh, so that, these are the, the, oops, the states in the presence of coupling. And this is the same as the bare G0 state. The ground state is left unchanged. And the two higher excited states are I'll label E0 and uh, G1, for lack of a better name, R, and they take uh, the form uh, G1 plus E0. Normalized and G1 minus E0, again, normalized. And these uh, states are maximally entangled states of the light and um and the and matter and so in, a priori this looks like very quantum states and so what i'll be talking about a priori looks like something which is very quantum will probe these entangled states of light and matter let's come back to this so now what we would like to do is to probe uh, these uh, states in an experiment and see the signature of this strong light matter coupling. And we also have to define what we mean by strong light matter coupling. And the experiment that we'll, we will do is simple. What we will do is we will have, a, again, our cavity uh, and a qubit in the middle. And we will probe transmission, OK? And we know exactly now how to Compute uh, things like this, right? We we know how we know we know exactly the type of measurements that that we're re I'm referring to uh, here. This transmission, what it will be, right? Uh, we know that. Remember, I wrote that the 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 the, the field can be written as e to the i phi, which is x plus i p, and essentially what I'll be plotting now is uh, by transmission I mean uh, a square, right? I'm putting this amplitude. And because of input-output relation, uh, uh, the, the field inside the cavity, the A inside the cavity is related to the transmission outside of the cavity. Then these are things that we've already shown before. So we can build on this. Okay, so this is what I will be plotting. In an experiment, you measure transmission. So if there is no atom, what you expect to see is simple the amplitude, or a, rather the, the, the amplitude squared, the power, as a function of frequency uh, of, of some input frequency omega, will be peaked at the cavity frequency. Of course, if you're driving uh, at a frequency which is way off resonance, most of the field will be reflected. If you're driving on resonance, the field will be transmitted. And so what you see is what I just said, off resonance, no transmission, on resonance, large transmission goes down again. That should be a nice Lorentzian because I'm incapable of drawing correctly. It's uh, something. And the width of this will be given by kappa. 
And that kappa is exactly the same kappa as we've put in the master equation that I've given before. So if you were to solve the master equation that I've given before, uh, uh, now in the absence of an atom and you solve for the steady state and you plot amplitude uh, versus frequency, uh, input frequency, you will see exactly this plot, this, this result. Now, of course, uh, with uh, the atom, uh, uh, the situation is different. Uh, the situation is different because we need to go back to this drawing. Now, uh, 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 at, in the absence of any coupling, if G was equal to zero, what we were probing was essentially these transitions, right? We were pro probing these transitions, which are, by the way, always the same. For an harmonic oscillator, it's you go up the ladder and always at the same energy. In the presence of the atom, of course, the situation is drastically different. What you're probing are the dressed states of light and matter. Now, uh, what you will be probing is this dress ladder. And so you do not expect anymore to see uh, any signal, any response of the cavity at the bare cavity frequency, simply because there is no nothing to respond anymore. There's no states, there's no nothing to respond at that particular frequency. You do, however, expect to see a response at this new frequency, which is the resonator frequency minus G and resonator frequency plus G. Note, moreover, that while on the left-hand side here, the next states were all at the same energy. Now the next states are all at different energies. And so you, uh, oops, <laughs> funny. Um, now uh, you, you, will, you will expect to see a more complicated stru uh, structure. But let's not explore these, these uh, high energy states right now. What we will do is, experiments where we'll just tickle the system. We will just send, in fact, on average, much, much less than a photon in such a way that the probability to excite these higher energy levels is almost zero, okay? So these experiments are not simple to do because the power is so weak, you need to average for a long time, okay? So you measure for a long time and you just tickle the system with very few photons. So what should we expect to see? Well, rather than saying what we should expect to see, let me just show you what we actually see. So I will, again, do this thing of moving to Keynote. Now you should see a Keynote presentation where I'll show you this slide now. So <clears throat> what you're seeing first uh, is not circuit QD, but how this is done in KBT QD, regular KBT QD. So these are experiments by, uh, that's, a pl that's a plot from a typical experiment from Jeff Kimball's lab at uh, Caltech. So these are the experiments which are uh, dating back to uh, the early nineties, you see. And what you have is a, a KBT formed by these two mirrors. And up there you have a cloud of, of a cesium atom and they are all uh, in some trap. And at some point you release the atoms and they fall down uh, under gravity. And if you're lucky, there is on average one atom inside the cavity. So they couldn't really control the number of atoms. On average, you have something like a single atom. And now you uh, probe uh, by shining a laser through the cavity and measuring here uh, clicks. This is not a number line detection. This is done at optical frequency. So you have a photo detector where you measure it directly transmitted power, different from what we're doing, but in the end, it's the same quantity. And here is what you are observing if you scan uh, frequency and observe transmitted power. What you observe is two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, dips, uh, two, two peaks. And what are these two peaks? Well, they, are cores they're, they correspond, or they should correspond to the two peaks, the two states separated by 2G around the KVD frequency. So here the KVD frequency is zero, and you see a peak which is at minus uh, uh, g, and one which is at plus g with a separation of two g. And the the points are data. The lines are what you expect to see if there was on average one atom in the cavity. Uh, again, they cannot know exactly how many atoms there are, and light matter coupling in fact increases with more atoms. 
Uh, so here, they really wanted to show this interaction between a single atom interacting with a single photon in the cavity. And so they had to be careful that, or be rather confident that it was a single uh, atom. And so that's the best they could do. OK, so now fast forward to 2004 with, with the circuit, the first circuit QED experiment, in fact, that demonstrated this, this strong might, might matter coupling. And this is what you see. This is, again, KVD transmission as a function of, uh, of frequency. Uh, focus first on the dashed line, which shows you the measurement in the absence of an atom. So now you have an empty cavity, a resonator, a transmission line resonator, without any uh, uh, qubit. And as a, as a result, what you see is a response of the, of the cavity at its natural frequency, uh, 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 which is here about 6 gigahertz. Now you place in the qubit. And uh, so you do the same experiment. And what you do, uh, what you see, I'm sorry, are these now these two peaks, uh, which are clearly resolved. They are now much better resolved than in this first experiment with atoms. So you're now using these artificial atoms, you can get much better resolution for this so-called vacuum rabbit splitting. Uh, these are first experiments, which were done in 2004 with uh, the ancestors of the transmon qubit, which is known as the Cooper pair box. It's a type of transmon which was sensitive to charge noise. By construction, it's a smaller object than the transmon. As a result, it has a smaller electric dipole. And as a result, it has a, a smaller coupling to the cavity than the transmon. So now you can repeat this experiment now post-2007 when the transmon was introduced. And this is what you rather see now. So now the the, the, notice the, the scale also, right? The scale is much bigger here than it was there. So what you see are extremely resolved uh, uh, vacuum Rabi doublets, OK? So this is not theory. This is data. Uh, I hope this will have not been discussed before. I, I, from what I understood, I don't think it was, but I hope it, it was not. Let me go back to this. OK, so this is working. <laughs> Not too bad to set up with the, the iPad and then the, the, the keynote presentation. So with Atom, what we therefore, as I, as I just said, what we expect to see and what we see, in fact, is this doublet, which well, I can be a little bit more optimistic and make the separation even smaller, bigger. Something like this. So while the cavity frequency is here, that's again transmission as a function of frequency, resonator frequency is here, and this is separated by now by 2G. Okay, so that's separated by 2G. And again, these two states correspond to these what you're probing is this transition and then that transition as you increase the drive frequency. The question now is what is the, if the separation is 2G, what is the line width? Uh, and the line width uh, is given by kappa plus 2 gamma 2 divided by 2. And why is that the case? Well, it's the case because of these states here. Let me recopy these states. That's the intuitive version. You can, of course, formalize that, but let me give you the intuitive version. What you see is that the, these two transitions, which are transitions from the ground state, which is just G0, to these dressed, maximum entangled dressed light uh, matter states. Well, you see that there's two error mechanisms, two, de two decay mechanisms in these two different states. First, there is qubit relaxation. Then there is, uh, um, sorry, photon relaxation, and then qubit relaxation. And because the, the because the, because the, 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 the these states are, are, are equivalent or uniform, the word I was looking for, uniform superposition of qubit and photon, 
what you're simply saying is the average between these two values. You remember before I gave the Purcell rate, where I said like, oh, there's a there's relaxation at the at the Purcell rate, uh, uh, which was g over delta squared times kappa, and that was coming from 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 this term here would add some g over delta, but that g over delta is something that happens in the dispersive regime, in the resonant regime that we're thinking about here. The weight of the two members of the superposition is uniform, is the same, and is just one half, or uh, the probability is one half. And so that gives you the one half, and so you simply add the two, uh, the two uh, decay rates. So it's kappa, and now it's gamma two, uh, in fact, two gamma two. So you might be surprised to see two gamma two here, but uh, uh, gamma two is something which was given, I believe, by Annie at the beginning of the, of the lecture. And gamma two, she would have tell, told you, is given by gamma one, which is the relaxation rate of the qubit divided by two, plus some pure dephasing rate. Some, some, some rate of dephasing, which has nothing to do with relaxation. And it turns out yeah, that in spectroscopy, the line widths in spectroscopy are given by two gamma two. We'll come back to this. In fact, in a few minutes, we will see this in a simpler situation. Uh, um, I will justify this again uh, using some formulas, but let, let's, let's start with this now, unless you have questions. Okay, but just looking at the form of these rest states, you can guess, that's the point, you can guess their, um, their line width. And so I said that we wanted to reach the strong coupling, and now we can define what we mean by strong coupling. Strong coupling is essentially defined by being able to resolve these two vacuum Rabi peaks, being able to resolve these two peaks. And so what we want is for 2G to be larger than the line width, kappa, uh, kappa over two plus gamma two. Uh, more colloquially, uh, you will often find in the literature that we want to have kappa bigger than gamma one and, and gamma phi. This is often what is said. Uh, I've not found any strict definition, or in fact, of what we mean by strong coupling. So uh, uh, I'll take this as a as a good enough definition. Uh, very good. So the key point here is that what uh, uh, talking, <laughs> setting a, uh, doing a sales pitch for circuit 3D, what it allows you to do is to reach much more uh, stronger regimes of strong coupling. So you, you can be much deeper in the strong coupling regime in circuit QED than is uh, easy or possible to do in cavity QED. And uh, the main reason for that is the very strong coupling that we can achieve with these macroscopic objects between these, these, the cavity and the macroscopic dipole of the, of the transmon qubit. Uh, because after all, our, our T1 uh, are often not as good as T1s of actual atoms, but nevertheless, uh, the coupling is so large here that this is overwhelming the, uh, everything. And, and what we see is this extremely clear splitting. Okay, one comment that I can make also is that um, I'm really excited here about showing some kind of avoided crossing. There was two levels. These two levels are, are degenerate, right? In the absence of a coupling and in the presence of a coupling, there is a, a, a avoided crossing. Uh, but, and I've, I've also claimed that, well, this is great. Uh, there is some entanglement. We're really probing entanglement. But can we really, made these claims here because after all you could if you were a skeptic you could say you could make a theory for this for the experiment that i've shown here which was just two linearly coupled harmonic oscillators classical harmonic oscillators okay and if you couple two harmonic oscillators and you will see an abundant crossing you see exactly the same physics as seen here in the subspace you'll see a mode repulsion as the, the frequency of the two oscillators uh, uh, start to match so in fact, there is nothing provably quantum in the experiments that I've just shown. Uh, the, the presence of this apodic crossing is not a proof that this is, uh, that there is anti-quantum and it's certainly not a proof that there is entanglement. In fact, 
to show uh, that this is really a quantum system that we're dealing with, one has to be able to probe the higher energy levels of the spectrum. Sorry, I keep scrolling again because now I want to go back here. You see, I made the point of saying that this square root of n is uh, square root of two is a signature of the matrix element of the creation and alienation operators of the field. Okay. And so this square root here is really a signature of the quantum nature of the field. And so if you are now able to probe these transitions to higher energy levels and you see that they match the, the square root of n uh, separation that you would expect, now you've really proved that you're dealing with a field which is quantum, a quantum field of, of light. Uh, and that's more difficult to do, but this has also been done. Uh, again, this was done, in fact, with a group of Andreas Wall Raff back in 2008 or 2009, I believe, where we were able to, to address the square root of n. And in the same year, in fact, a group of uh, Gerard Remper uh, did this also with uh, cavity QED, not circuit QED, but cavity QED with atoms. Okay, so we can, uh, we can do these experiments if we want. Excellent. Uh, questions? Uh, one thing that I can mention further is that it's super crucial that um, these experiments are done at low, low photon number. If you have something like this at a uh, average photon number in the cavity, which is much smaller than one. If you have an average photon number, which starts to be equal to one, what, uh, uh, or more, in fact, what happens is that you uh, will see that these peaks will shift. In fact, these peaks will start to move. There will be new peaks appearing inside and at very large photon number and much larger than one, what you will end up seeing is a single response at the at the cavity frequency. And, and why is that the case? Well, that's just the correspondence limit. Uh, in the small quanta number, you are seeing quantum features. You're seeing these these the signature of these uh, of these ankle entangled dread states. But at I in a large uh, number of, of, of quanta, you simply see the response of the classical cavity. There's another way to, to say this, also a very simple way to convince yourself, is that if you write this Hamiltonian, the James Cumming Hamiltonian, which is responsible for everything that we've talked about so far, well, you see that this scales as m, and this scales as square root of m, right? And uh, so at very large m, this will dominate. And so you can ignore this term and what you see is a response at the cavity frequency. Okay, that's a very boring way to say that we're reaching the correspondence limit, but that's an accurate way in evidence. Excellent. Uh, uh, so response at omega r at large power. So this is why these experiments have to be at very, done at very small time. Good. This is in fact the only thing that I wanted to say about the dispersive regime. I see now that I have something like uh, 15 minutes left. I mean, it's good. I can, um, I can continue. So this is a figure that I uh, placed there because I wanted to show it later. Let me try to hide it. Um, Hide it more. Okay. So we're ready to continue. Okay. So main thing to say, uh, we want to reach the strong coupling regime where we resolve these so-called vacuum ready splitting, and this is done where the when the coupling overwhelms the line width, which are related to kappa and gamma. And now I have to go back over this business of gamma two and and why is two gamma two and things like that. So we'll, we'll go back a little bit uh, to this, looking at the dispersive regime.
And again, please stop me if you have any questions. So as I said, uh, dispersive is realized for G over delta much more than one, uh, but more precisely, in fact, uh, it's really for N over N crit, much smaller than one, where N crit is the critical photon number, uh, which is given by this. Um, And in the review, the RFP, we gave a, a formula for this encrypt, which goes beyond uh, two level systems. Um, okay. Uh, why we're interested in this regime is particularly for quantum information processing. And if you look back here, uh, again, sorry for the scrolling, if you look back here, what you see is that in the resonant regime, qubits and cavity are completely entangled, are maximally entangled. And the, uh, at that point, the, the qubit has completely lost his, his identity. The, the qubit is now uh, <laughs> ill-defined. If you trace over the, field, the, the, the state of the field, the qubit is in a maximally mixed state, okay? So that's pretty bad. Uh, what you would like to have, uh, at least intuitively, that seems bad for quantum information processing. So rather, we move to this dispersive regime where the qubit resonator entanglement will be very small. Okay, and then in that situation, uh, the qubit still retains is uh, its own identity in a way. The entanglement is very small. And so we've already said that in the um, the, the, the Hamiltonian for the dispersive regime was the following. You've seen this Hamiltonian uh, many times, but that's okay. I should have uh, some kind of stamp to print this Hamiltonian whenever I need it. Uh, which uh, we will rewrite in a different way uh, uh, here. So remember that we packaged before this term together to, with this term. And now it looked like a shift of the cavity frequency. This is how we did the dispersive readout. Here we will write this in a different way, which rather looks like this. And Jens has done this, I believe, uh, from one of the questions he asked, but that's fine. Some repetition I think is useful. And here I'm adding a term that I dropped before. In this Hamiltonian, I had dropped a term. Nobody complained. And I, I'm putting back this term. Okay. So up, forget this one half for the moment. Apart from this one half, it's exactly the same Hamiltonian as before. I've just repackaged this in a different way. Now, rather than res a qubit shifting the state of the resonate, the frequency of the resonator, what you will see is that the uh, cavity is shifting the frequency of the qubit. So the frequency of the qubit is the prefactor of sigma z, which is now shifted by the cavity. And that's uh, known uh, as the uh, AC stoic shift. That's a standard result from second order perturbation theory, uh, which is now adapted to some, some quantized field rather than some classical field, but I'm sure you've done this for perturbation theory before. And you've done this with uh, Jens uh, how to obtain this dispersive Hamiltonian. So the, the AC stoic shift is given by two chi a dagger. And the term that I had dropped before because it wasn't really important in all of the discussion that we had at that point and not really here, but I just wanted to be a little bit more complete is now as the lamp shift. And uh, so this is simply given by chi, okay, because of the, the one half and the factor of two. Uh, I like, or generally we like to place this, so we could have put the two inside it. Now it would have looked like two a, 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 a plus uh, one, but pulling out this two now really looks like what it should, at least in my mind, it looks like photon number plus half a photon, if you want, plus vacuum. So that really is a signature that this is 
coming from interaction with vacuum fluctuations. And typically uh, uh, what we do uh, is we simply add a, like a prime here or, or simply redefine the Hamiltonian to include the lamp shift on, on which we have little control. Okay, so we just include this typically in the artificial definition of the frequency of the of the qubit. Okay, so now what we want to look at in the next ten minutes plus a little bit of tomorrow uh, uh, is to look at the consequences of that expression. But uh, uh, so consequences of this expression. And there are many. Uh, these are all simple expressions, but there's a lot of physics to explain. But to do that, I will go first, and that's the only thing I'll be able to do now, to go to a simpler situation. And we'll analyze a simpler situation. I'll just remove the cavity, in fact. Uh, and then we will be, be in good shape to, to go back to uh, the full uh, 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 glory of the Hamiltonian with the, the coupling to. So first, uh, in your the cavity, but add a drive on the qubit. So what I want to do here is essentially the same type of experiments that we were looking at here. You see here we're looking at amplitude or amplitude squared as a function of frequency. We're doing spectroscopy of the KVD. Now what I would like to do is to do spectroscopy of the qubit. So this is the problem that I'm setting up here. So uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is I, I'm ignoring the KVD and I'll just probe the qubit and see how it responds. And once we've understood that, we'll be able to look at probing the qubit in the presence of the KVD and see how it responds. Okay, so qubits, so we want to do qubit spectroscopy. Uh, and we, you know this from uh, atomic physics, right? You have some atom and then you, you shine some light and you collect the light which comes out and that tells you something about the response of the, the qubit. And so the Hamiltonian which describes this situation is given by the qubit frequency, sigma z, plus the field, the, 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 the Rabi drive, if you want to use this language. And so, this, uh, I mean, the Hamiltonian reads like this. This is something which you've already seen, maybe not exactly in this language, but this is something that Ian's already described. When you drive uh, a transmon, you have a terms which, uh, the term which, the drive term looks like this. Maybe you rewrote this as B dagger B, uh, B dagger plus B, the, the, the number operator of the, the, yeah, the number operator of the, of the, um, um, of the um, of the transpon, it's a little bit confusing because it's um, I say number, but that doesn't look like a number operator. That looks like a quadrature. But what I mean is the 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 charge, the charge, the Cooper pair number, the charge of the transpon, which we write then as b dagger plus b. So there's two different types of numbers here. There are bosonic numbers and and charge uh, Cooper pair numbers. So sorry for the confusion. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, this B dagger plus B uh, in the two level system approximation is simply, this is simply sigma plus plus sigma minus, which is just sigma X. So since he already gave you uh, uh, this term, you already now know this. So this is how you drive a, a transmon qubit or typically a two level system. And so what we do uh, now is as usual is the, is we do a rotating uh, wave approximation, the same way that we drop some terms in the Rabi Hamiltonian before to obtain the James coming Hamiltonian. So we do a RWA. And uh, we will also move to a frame which is rotating at a dry frequency. We know this, we've done this before. So the Hamiltonian for the qubit, now, with a prime because it's in a rotating frame, in a, with a wiggly line because this is a an approximation, now looks like this. That's the Hamiltonian that you are familiar with for a two-level system that is driven. Okay, that's just the Hamiltonian of a driven system where the, 
the, the, the effective frequency and this the frequency in this rotating frame is the difference between the qubit frequency and the drive frequency. So if you drive on resonance, you only have an X. If you don't drive on resonance, you have both. Okay, so the same way that we looked at, oh, now I'm seeing this figure a little bit too soon. In the same way that we looked before at the response of the, remember we looked at response of the cavity as a function of the drive frequency. Now we want to look at the response of the qubit as a function of this drive frequency. But now the right quantity to look at is not the amplitude of some transmission. Rather, what we want to look at is what is the probability for the drive to excite the qubit? And okay, I'm saying all of these things, but you know this, but my, you know the answer, but my goal is just to formalize things such that when I show the result with a cavity, there's no surprise, okay? So that's, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time for these things. So the KB, the qubit is uh, sitting at, at, at its own frequency. And so what we expect to see is as before, when you, the drive is on resonance, it will succeed in, in uh, uh, flipping the qubit state. When it's away from the, when it's on resonance, it will succeed. When it's away from, when it's away from resonance, uh, it will not succeed and the, the qubit will stay in its, in its ground state. So the question that I would like to ask, and I think probably I won't have time to do that. I will just show you the result and then we'll do that next time. The thing that I want to talk about is the line width. In the, before for the cavity, it was simply kappa, or it was a combination of kappa and gamma for the vacuum ready splitting. We will see here that it's a little bit more complicated. A two level system is richer than an harmonic oscillator, and we will see that richness here. And the next thing that we want to understand is the height of this thing, but mostly the line width, because this is what we will um, be interested in um, uh, later. Uh, when we put back the cavity, this line width will do something very uh, interesting. So we'll need to understand that. Okay. So I think I should stop here and we will stop. We will start here for the next lecture. So I'm a little bit behind what I wanted, but that's fine. I, I still have time to complete the two topics tomorrow, finish this and uh, talk about single photon detection.